Hello and welcome to my series on banking regulation and the resolution of banking crises. I've put in the background a picture of Keystone Bank, um, which is a Nigerian bank that had to be temporarily nationalised until it was bought up by private investors. In this video, I'll be explaining why countries don't like scenarios where they have to bail out banks. Um, and that's one of the purposes of bank regulation to prevent banking crises or failure of banks. Um, and also we'll be talking about how banking crises are resolved. I'm going to start with my references, which is a bit atypical, but it's because I found the best textbook for banking in the entire world. Alan Berger's The Oxford Handbook of Banking is a fantastic book. And um, it goes through and really, really treats the material um, on anything that you want to know on banking theory, anything you want to know on the micro, uh, microeconomics of banking, as well as the, um, what I'll be talking about today, the kind of subject matter um, around bank regulation and um, banking crises. So it's a great book to get. It's also, even though it doesn't look in the picture, it's also huge. So if you ever need a weapon, if you have a home invasion or you need to hit somebody on the head in self-defense, then the book has two purposes for you. You can learn all about banking, bank regulation and bank crises, and it's also a self-defense tool. So um, let's get into the subject matter um, and I'll tell you what I'm going to talk about um, in this module. I'm going to talk about the elements and objectives of bank regulation. Why do we regulate banks in the first place? Why isn't the newspaper seller or the person selling um, gala or the person selling face masks outside the supermarket? Why aren't they regulated? Why do banks need special regulation in the first place? Then in the second unit, I'll be talking about the international rules for prudential regulation and why there are international rules for prudential reg uh, regulation. I shall then be talking about bank financial stability, bank structure, and shadow banking, which is one of my favorite topics. And I'll have lots of pictures of shadowy figures. Um, and then I'm going to be talking about macro prudential regulation, which is different from micro prudential regulation and why that has become popular in the recent years. I'll also be talking about in unit five, deposit insurance and the lender of the last resort. I'll be talking about how we deal with bank failures, um, bail-ins versus bailouts. I'll be talking about the institutional structure of bank regulation and whether there should be one regulator sort of looking after all financial activities, or you should have a more fragmented model of more specialized um, regulators. And then finally, I'll be talking about issues in international regulation in offshore financial centers, particularly and um, there's loads of pictures of lovely beaches um, because that's what most people think of when they think of offshore financial centers. I've also included a picture here of the most famous central bank governors in the world, the current central, uh, in the world, let's just say the world. Okay, Nigeria, sorry, Nigeria is kind of like my world for now, um, but the most famous central bank governors um, in Nigeria, are the most recent ones, um, Godwin Emefile is the current um, CBN governor. So we've got him up front. Um, and then we've got um, Charles Saludo, who was a very famous central bank governor um, who instituted a lot of reforms and um, also um, San, um, Sanusi, Lamido Sanusi. So moving swiftly on the objectives of unit one. Um, I'll do a brief introduction, talk about the difference between bank failure and banking crises. Um, I'll be talking about what's unique about banks and why um, bank regulation is different from regulating a non-financial firm, um, prudential reg regulation for a basic bank, and then um, the global financial crisis, which is kind of a running theme throughout this module um, and the role of regulation. So this is a picture of um, the actor who played Michael Burry um, in The Big Short. It's a movie about the global financial crisis. And um, he, Michael Burry, the real one, is actually a medical doctor. Um, and he was able to spot trends in the subprime market, which made him um, bet against 
the mortgage market when everybody kind of doubted him um, and he made a lot of money for his hedge funds at that time so that's why he became famous um, and because the global financial crisis is an overriding theme I'll be using quite a few pictures from the financial um, global financial crisis or things that bring up memories of, of the global financial crisis um, so in the overview um, I think to start with I think it's important to point out that major developments in bank regulation have been prompted by financial crises and you'll see that pattern throughout when I speak about bank regulation that the net condition say of a certain type of bank regulation um, actually developed as a reaction um, to a certain financial crisis um, and we'll be looking at sort of a simple model of a bank and um, then looking at the model of what an actual bank looks like which is far more complex. We'll also be looking at techniques that the regulators use um, to try and um, exert some control over banks. So the liquidity ratios, capital adequacy requirements, especially risk adjusted capital adequacy, which we'll be deep diving into um, in unit two. We all believe that or a lot of people believe that someone somewhere is in charge. Um, some people believe in God, some people believe in a supreme being, some people believe that the universe is in charge, but generally we believe that something somewhere is in charge and, and um, we're not acting, you know, completely unsupervised. Um, even though a lot of us believe that we're not acting completely unsupervised in our lives. Um, the banking industry doesn't have that same type of history of somebody watching over them. In fact, um, clear, transparent regulation of the banking industry doesn't have a long history at all. Um, until America's Banking Act, which was in 1933, no depositor in a US bank could have really been assured of clear regulatory oversight. Um, and, you know, there'd been a lot of confusing and, and a lot of wrangling about um, what type of regulation and who was supposed to regulate and whether banks were even supposed to be self-regulating um, until, you know, that very first banking act that kind of changed the game. Um, and in the United Kingdom, the Bank of England, people don't realise, was actually historically just a normal private bank, um, just a big one. And um, regulatory powers were only passed to the Bank of England in 1979. Uh, previously, it had exerted really only informal um, authority in the City of London. I think it's important to also point out, before we get too far into this module, um, it's really important to understand for the coming weeks the difference between bank failure and the banking crisis. So banking crises are crises of the system. They occur when there's a failure or near failure of a number of banks or financial institutions that put a lot of deposits um, in a country from the country's savers and credit to businesses and the country's payment systems into jeopardy. And it may involve a number of small banks or it may involve one mega bank. And um, we'll be talking a lot more about this too big to fail and systemically important bank um, as we go on in this module. That is a banking crisis, the spillover effects, the contagions, et cetera. And sometimes that those spillover effects don't only affect the domestic market, but actually affect international markets as well. A bank failure, however, is something that happened with the bank I described, the Nigerian bank that was in the first picture, something like Keystone Bank, Mainstream Bank, um, a few of the banks that had to be um, nationalized. These were small-ish banks. Um, they were not the great big you know, banks that we knew of um, that were systemically um, important. And those, the failure of those banks um, did not, result in a widespread sort of international contagious 
banking crisis in Nigeria. It was severe, and I would say maybe there was a mini crisis, but it was able to be contained within a relatively short period of time. So there is some overlap between a bank failure and um, a banking crisis, but definitely, you know, when I would classify a bank failure as a bank that fails. And that's very different from this sort of international contagion, the confusion, large numbers of deposits, the country's payment systems, you know, banks can't get access to credit, um, the kind of thing that we saw in the global financial crisis. The most prominent role for bank regulators and supervisors at all central banks in the world is what we call prudential regulation. And prudential regulation, or and more specifically, microprudential regulation focuses directly on individual banks. What are they doing? What are their capital ratios? How much liquidity do they have? How are they adhering to good market discipline? What's the called governance structure? This is the most prominent role for bank regulators, central banks and supervisors. Banking crises are actually more common than most people think. The World Financial Centers, according to Ray Hart and Rog uh, Rogoff, um, the United States, the United Kingdom and France have had sort of 12, 13 and 15 episodes of banking crisis since it's the 1800s, respectively. Um, and even in countries that we think are, are pretty stable and pretty prudent, like Sweden, like Finland, um, they've still faced these banking crises. And of course, in Spain, um, a lot of people can remember um, the Spanish banking crisis um, as well. And that was that was a huge crisis, accounting for 20% of deposits. In Finland, the Finnish banking crisis, um, the government had to take control of three banks, accounting for 31% of deposits. Um, in Sweden, five of the six largest banks were insolvent or faced difficulties. And of course, you've got you've had similar situations in uh, Japan and um, in the United States. So it's not as uncommon um, as a lot of people think. And thankfully, um, the situation I described in Nigeria, where the bank, um, where the government had to take over temporarily um, some of the banks, they weren't our largest and most significant bank. Um, but you can see that in other countries, you know, that hasn't been the case. So why are we so worried about banking crises in the first place? We worry about banking crises and we try to prevent them because banking crises have large economic costs. And one indicator of those costs is the subsequent rise in government debt. The reason why government borrowing increases during banking crises and a banking crisis can turn into a sovereign debt crisis where the sovereign or the state is actually you know, borrowing way too much money and getting over leveraged itself because it's trying to bail out the over leveraged banks um, is because of three factors. Number one, the governments bail out the banking system by injecting capital or buying up um, some of the toxic assets within the bank. Um, and that causes the government may have to borrow to do that. And then number two, the banking crisis means that credit isn't getting to businesses because they've become illiquid or insolvent, the banks have. So that means when businesses aren't getting credit, they can't sell anything, um, so they don't pay as much taxes. So that puts the government into jeopardy in terms of their um, fiscal balance sheets. Um, also in terms of government's um, reaction to banking crises, when everybody's broke um, and, gov and businesses are laying off staff, and when you know the economy isn't working again, the governments often tend to try and artificially stimulate the economy. Um, so if anybody remembers um, sort of during the COVID pandemic, um, the UK government did these huge furlough schemes, right? I think it was huge sums of money, about 400 billion pounds paid to restaurants, paid to businesses, paid to individuals. And then in America, the stimulus checks, remember that was massive spending there. Um, in Nigeria, well, they, they bought, the, the Nigerian government isn't that rich, so the Nigerian government bought food. Um, we had Indomie and rice um, that was given to citizens, but that was still government spending. Um, and during recessions, governments tend to try to stimulate the economy um, by giving out money um, in developed countries and uh, giving out needles. 
in less developed countries. Um, so all that money being spent um, often increases expenditure and governments may have to borrow to finance that. Um, again, um, these two researchers, Reinhardt and Rogoff, calculates that due to um, such or, so a combination or any one of these um, steps that governments take during banking crises, that there's a near doubling of the stock of government debt. So now you're beginning to understand why governments don't want to try to prevent banking crisis, right? Because you can literally double, governments have been known to double the amount of debt that they have because of a banking crisis. And um, there's no real systematic difference in between emerging and advanced countries in those costs. So banking crises are just as bad for advanced countries as they are for emerging markets. So I concentrated on bank crises. I just like to um, make sure that we are all aware that there's several different kinds of crises. Bank, banking crises are not the only type of um, financial crises um, that countries suffer. Um, the ty different types of crises include um, sovereign debt defaults, so um, default on debt held by non-residents um, when the government borrows too much and they just can't pay it back and they can't even service the interest. Domestic sovereign debt default, which is local investors in local, usually a local currency um, that the government defaults on. Currency crashes, where there's you know these large falls in the value of the currency, and definitely we've seen at least relative falls in the value of the currency, um, the Naira as a currency. Um, and then we have inflation outbursts, so periods of very high inflation that reduces the real um, value of the currency. And I've put a beautiful picture of um, Victoria Falls here. Um, reminds me of Zimbabwe. I don't know if this is the Zimbabwe side or the Zambia side, actually. But um, I, I'm referring to Zimbabwe and you know um, the hyperinflation that Zimbabwe experienced um, and has it still experiencing um, has, has experienced over the past decade or so and then of course banking crises which is really sort of the subject of this module in general it takes countries longer to recover from a banking crisis than it does other types of financial crises such as currency crashes and that's why you know bank regulation is so important and I, I think that if I was going to emphasize any one thing I mean this is a long module if I was going to emphasize one thing it's you know banking crises and um, should be avoided and that's the job of the regulators that's the job of the supervisors to try and make sure that we don't end up in that situation where governments are doubling the amount of debt that they have their total debt stock um, people are suffering people are losing their jobs businesses are going bankrupt as a result of banking crises so that's that's really something that um, the um, regulators try to prevent. So I think this slide, I've explained everything on this slide in the last slide. Um, why are banks so special? People complain about banking bailouts. Why do we have to pamper them and tell them they're special and every time pet them every time they cry? Why do we treat banks like babies? Um, and it's, it's, it's simply because of the damage that banking crises um, can do to the economy. Um, and actually, there are a few other special sectors. If you think of the pharmaceutical sector, for instance, they are highly regulated by the FDA in America um, and by NAFDAQ in Nigeria. And because getting that wrong um, can result in death and disability for people, uh, water companies and power companies um, sometimes are regulated by the government as well. Um, so th there is reason. There is a reason why um, banks are treated by babies, like babies, and it's um, it's basically because a banking crisis can destroy the economy um, and really cause a lot of pain um, for people. In fact, during recessions and during crises, rates of suicide um, go up in certain societies. So um, I, I I think that that's um, the main reason um, why banks are special. And the role of prudential regulation um, is to limit the ability of banks. Banks are in the business of risk. And um, if you try to eliminate risk completely as a central bank, then you'll eliminate banking. 
But what prudential regulation does try to do is limit the ability of banks to profit indefinitely by taking increasing amounts of risk. Um, but like I said, it doesn't try to eliminate risk completely, otherwise you just eliminate the banks. Um, I'm going to talk about the difference between sort of a basic bank model where there's assets and liabilities and depositors um, puts money into the bank and those um, deposits are then transformed um, through maturity transformation into longer term loans. That's a really simple um, model of a bank, but banks have become more complex than that and that has made regulating them um, more complex and again this is a theme that you'll see throughout um, this module about regulators continually having to evolve and change as banks become more complex and definitely the existence of large and very very developed markets um, for very short-term deposits means that the liquidity risk is very different from the liquidity risk that I described in the basic bank model um, that assumes that you know cash and other liquid assets kind of respond passively to changes in deposits that um, result from customers' choices. So I'll finish this unit just introducing what's going to come in the next few units with talking about the tension between banks and regulators. And there we have, you know, there's tons of cartoons in Nigeria um, talking about the central bank governor um, because there's a tension between the responsibility of the central bank to deliver this essential microprudential supervision and policy and um, just what banks and some of the organized private sector want. Prudential regulation, like I said, limits the ability of banks to profit indefinitely from just taking more and more risk. But at the same time, banks come up with new ways to manage risk um, and new innovations like regulatory arbitrage to try and avoid the regulation. Um, and that's why there's a built intention within prudential regulation, which is always trying to adapt and always trying to evolve um, and always um, sort of generating new challenges. So almost as fast as the banks, um, the, the central banks come up with new regulations, the banks kind of find a way around it. And um, I think, yeah, this overview has really set us up for the next few modules. Um, I'm sorry, the next few units. Um, where we'll be really taking a deep dive into that world and looking um, very specifically at some of the bank regulations and how they've evolved. Welcome to Unit 2. Here we're going to be discussing the principles of weight, uh, risk weighted capital adequacy rules, the different approaches to the determination of risk weight explaining the meanings of tier one capital versus tier two capital versus common equity capital and why that matters, the rationale for the leverage ratio rules, the rationale for liquidity ratio rules, how to distinguish between liquidity coverage ratio and net stable funding ratio, and look at the Basel III rules, which are the most recent iteration um, of the Basel rules and how they might be able to prevent a systemic banking crisis, which was, I guess, one of the weaknesses of the previous iterations of the Basel policies. And in this unit, um, because Basel is actually in Switzerland, I, I've put lots of pictures of how I think that Basel might look. I think it will be really snowy and beautiful. I don't know because I haven't even Googled the pictures of Basel, but this is just my imagination that it must be sort of some kind of winter getaway um, that central bankers and policymakers and people um, with macro prudential and micro prudential um, expertise just sort of hide away and, and, and talk about these issues all winter and then come out in summer with a new set of rules. And that's what I'd like to think. So what are the objectives of this unit? Really, we're going to be talking about Basel 1, 2 and 3. And this is a, another snow picture.
So before I start on Basel 1, 2, and 3, I'm, I'm going to sort of set out the two things, the two main risks uh, for any bank. Liquidity risk, the risk that, like I explained, banks perform a maturity transformation. So you give them your short-term deposits, you put money in the bank, your salary goes into the bank and you want to spend it on ASOS or on Jumia or on Amazon the next minute. So it's very short-term deposits. Um, and they perform a maturity transformation um, into longer term assets because what they're funding, they're funding Richard Branson and Elon Musk and um, Aliko Dangote and people that are doing projects over like four or five years, but you want to get your money out tomorrow. Um, so the liquidity risk is the risk that a bank may become illiquid because um, all of you guys want your money and um, your money is with Elon Musk. The second is around credit risk, and that's um, the risk of Elon Musk or Richard Branson or Aliko Dangote or any of the various small businesses that they learn to not being able to pay back. Now, there are two instruments used to manage this risk. The liquidity ratios, you, banks have to keep a certain amount of money liquid, and the risk adjusted capital ratios. They also have to keep a buffer um, of capital, different types of capital, which I'll be explaining. Um, within the system, so they can't, you know, give it all out as loans. And that means that if people don't pay back, they still have a bit of money. So another snow picture, Basel. So the Basel, um, Basel 1, Basel 2 and Basel 3 are sort of the hallmark policies or guidelines um for fiscal management i'm oh, sorry not fiscal management um prudential management of banks made to guide supervisors and central bankers on an international scale and um, i can't quite remember the story but i think that um it was in the 80s or maybe the late 70s that a bank collapsed in germany um, and it had, it was owing an American bank and it caused trouble for the American bank. And that was when central bankers went into a panic, right? Because they realized that the world was becoming more connected and a bank failure in Germany could affect, for the first time, I think they started realizing that it could affect a bank in America. Um, and the, I think it was about seven central bank governors that actually, um, started the first Basel Accord um, and that was the foundation of, of Basel I. So it was the first sort of coordinated and a cooperative approach between regulators to kind of look at these issues and say, you know, what can we do about this? What set of guidelines can we put out um, to central banks? Um, for the management of their banks in their countries. And it wasn't legally binding. So I can remember listening to the sort of the chairman, if you Google um, Basel123 um, and put it into YouTube, um, there's actually a video by um, the, I think he's the chairman or former chairman of the Bank of International Settlements. And I'll link, when I post this video on YouTube, I'll link his video below. Um, and he said that he found it so hard to convince a judge that this needed to happen um, because the judge was worried about all the legal um, jurisdictions, etc. And all they wanted to do was put together a set of guidelines. No bank in the world is legally mandated. You can't sort of uh, to, um, to follow the Basel um, guidelines. So these are guidelines, but it's best practice. And as we go through the Basel guidelines, you can see that Nigerian banks um, base the sort of the central banking policy um, with regard to regulation on Basel, as do most banks around the world. So the Basel regulations focus on two issues, capital adequacy. Do you have enough capital? Remember what I told you, um, some people don't pay back their loans. So do you have enough capital to cover that up? And what's the quality of the capital? And what's the quantity of the capital? And then the second, are you liquid? Liquidity. Do you have money 
because banks need to have money. If you go to your bank and they tell you that they've given your money to entrepreneurs and you can't withdraw it today and you're hungry and you can't go to the supermarket, you'd be a big problem. So um, banks need capital and uh, they need liquidity. And those are two different things. So those two main areas that the Basel Accords sort of focus on can be divided um, further into when we talk about capital adequacy, we talk about the quantity of capital, we talk about the risk adjusted capital adequacy. So what type of capital we talk about alternative measures of risk and um, that becomes more apparent in Basel II and Basel III. We talk about the maximum leverage ratio. We talk about the um, capital adequacy differentiation of the banking book to the trading book. Um, and I'll explain that later as well. Um, and then we also talk about the quality of the capital as well as um, liquidity. So how liquid are you? What's your liquid uh, liquidity coverage ratio and your net stable funding ratio? So I think the Basel Accords, I, I see some similarity actually between the Basel Accords and the Ten Commandments. Um, however, the Ten Commandments were given all at the same time, whereas the Basel Accords have been given over a period of several decades and um, revised as things change. Um, the Basel um, Accords came from policymakers and economists and um, were arrived at by consensus, whereas um, the Ten Commandments um, came from God. Um, and like I said, each is an improvement on the last um, when it comes to the Basel Accords. So there's some differences between the Ten Commandments and the Basel Accords, but there's some similarities as well in that these are sort of guidelines. I mean, the Ten Commandments were designed as guidelines um, for a good life. And um, the Basel Accords are designed as guidelines for a good, healthy, prudential supervision of banks. See, I got there in the end. So Basel one, hey, another snow picture. So this is a kind of like snow little house that I imagine, um, you know, economists and policymakers from all over the world sort of gathering in um, for their annual sort of revision of the um, Basel guidelines um, in, in collaboration with the, the, the Bank of International Set, um, the, ba the Bank of um, International Settlements. Um, and Basel one, was in 1998, uh, 1988. It was sort of a really special time when, like I said, it was it was historic. The first guidelines available for bank supervision. So um, super exciting. Um, and the first idea was that a bank's capital should be eight percent of risk weighted assets. So the money in the bank should be 8% of the risk assets like loans. But just saying that wasn't enough. There were two issues around that statement that needed to be clarified in Basel 1. Number one was the denominator. Because there's different ways to measure risk assets and different ways to calculate that risk. So how risky is your risk asset, right? And then the second issue that Basel I wanted to get to the bottom of is the numerator. What types of financial investments in the bank should be counted as capital? So I'll explain this on the next slide, what the, the Basel guys in this kind of like snowy little house came up with. It's another snowy building saying more or less what I said on the last slide. The Basel crew in 1998 in their, uh, 1988 in their wisdom um, decided that there were five buckets of assets. The best sort of gold standard capital would be gold or cash, right? These are things that are obviously 
you know, going to be classified as capital. These are things that keep you safe. If you have cash or gold, then that's like easily convertible to money. Um, so that was something that they were going to classify in the best sort of asset, the best type of capital, right? The best type of capital is cash. It can pay for anything. It's not misinterpreted um, and it's liquid. The second bucket that they put um, a risk is public sector assets. So public sector assets are loans to governments, loans to the British government, loans to the American government, sovereign risk, um, where you know your country can always kind of pay money, uh, print money to pay you back. Sovereign risk was deemed as um, sovereign assets or public sector assets were deemed as quite low risk and almost as good as gold or cash. Then in number three, um, in the third tier of risk, they looked at sort of multilateral development organizations like the World Bank, for instance, or the um, African Development Bank in um, Nigeria, or the CDC, or the, you know, the, the multilateral um, development banks that are associated with governments. Um, you know, pretty good risk, right? So you wouldn't expect them to, um, you would expect to be able to get your money back from them. So these were still all high quality assets. So the, the first buckets, gold, cash, public sector assets, multilateral development organizations, um, loans to them seemed to be almost on the par with cash in that order, um, but good, you know, strong forms of capital or um, strong forms of assets. Um, and then in the sort of lower tier kind of higher risk, higher risk and poorer quality were mortgages. So um, home mortgages were seen as, you know, low, slightly lower quality uh, and then private businesses um, like, you know, small businesses like you and me were seen as extremely poor quality. So they kind of categorized it like that. So you could see the quality of the assets and know that assets were not all equal. And I've put back at six as Nigeria and big men, just as a joke. Um, there's sort of an in-joke in Nigeria about sort of, you know, these, these uh, what we call the Amcon list of like um, super rich people that um, don't pay back their loans. And like, there's always in Nigeria, there's always these like names in the newspaper of like, I think banks sometimes call them chronic debtors or unrepentant debtors. And you just see the bank like, like two pages of the newspaper sort of like trying to expose these people uh, for not paying back their, their, their debts. But that's just a joke and I hope it helps you remember um, that, you know, one of the things that Basel I did and one of the things that they did quite, um, I think quite wisely and quite sagely is realize that um, all assets aren't equal and sort of divide them into buckets according to their riskiness. Um, they also classify different types of capital as well. So tier one capital comprised of, you know, core capital and, you know, the equity and shares and common stock of the bank, non-cumulative um, preference shares, the bank's disclosed revenue, um, measuring sort of accumulated on distributed business earnings. Um, and then tier two capital really comprised of other, cap other types of capital, undisclosed reserves, um, reserves, arising from periodic asset valuations, um, various type of types of debt and equity instruments, as well as subordinated debt. And the rule that they made in Basel one, oh, look another skiing picture, is that you should not have more tier two capital than tier one capital. So what they wanted to see was more tier one capital, equity, equity, non-cumulative um, preference shares and actual reserves, so business earnings, um, cash reserves. The weaknesses of Basel I, I actually like Basel I because um, it's, it's straightforward, it's easy to understand, um, there's no complex calculations, and as you see, um, the subsequent Basel Accords actually get more difficult to understand and more complex. Um, but it was identified that Basel I had certain weaknesses, two major weaknesses. Number one, um, arbitrary um, risk weightings. So uh, the risk ratings weren't quite right. They weren't quite detailed enough. They weren't quite sensitive enough 
um, and then also um, it allowed for regulatory arbitrage without looking at the the conduits for regulatory arbitrage um, and not taking into consideration um, the like I said the conduits or the instruments um, that were being used um, for regulatory arbitrage. Enter Basel II. Basel II, 2004, um, offered banks and national regulatory supervisors an alternative ways to measure risks in different asset classes, um, and also extended capital requirements to cover operational risk um, as well as credit risk attached directly to assets. And I think it also um, looked at market risk as well. So the alternative measures of risk fall into two broad categories. So what they agreed they would use to measure risk um, in a more sensitive way. Number one was the standardized approach where banks would have to use risk weights for each asset within a, bu uh, within a bucket. Um, and um, that um, sort of weighting rating would have to be um, approved by a credit rating agency um, like Fitch or Standard and Poor's um, and that was seen to be more granular than sort of the broad brush of Basel I. Um, and then there was the internal rating so for the first time banks were actually allowed to use their own internal rating, um, rating assessments um, for credit risk. Um, they introduced formulas that they should use, but um, you know they could do that internally as well. So you could use um, an external credit rating um, agency, or you could use your own internal credit rating. And this is where the complex formulas came in, such as probability of default, loss given default, exposure at default, maturity, etc., um, to come up with again a more detailed or more granular um, approach. Basel III. Oh gosh, this was after the financial crisis that um, they got together again and decided that there would need to be another iteration um, of um, the Basel Accords, and quite rightly so. I mean, after Basel II, the global financial system collapsed. So there was actually a Basel 2.5 <laughs> that was done sort of immediately to try and arrest the situation. Um, and then um, a more sort of coherent Basel 3. Um, and I have a dog looking quite stressed here because whenever I read the Basel 3 guidelines, um, it looks mad stressful. And um, they haven't fully been implemented. I think that we're moving into the era of Basel 3, but um, I don't think many banks have implemented fully um, the Basel 3 um, recommendations. Um, the Basel III recommendations were around elements that strengthen capital adequacy rules and address um, liquidity um, adequacy as well. Um, and the main innovations were new ways of calculating capital, maximum leverage rules, rules to strengthen adequacy, and then the distinction between trading book assets and, uh, and banking assets, um, as well as um, I put the dog here to remind me as well um, um, about the work done um, or, um, on stress tests in um, Basel III. So a lot more complex. Each iteration has become um, more complex than the other. But I think the banking industry um, was also evolving and becoming more complex, which was one of the trends I um, sort of spoke about in my introduction. And I guess the regulations and the guidelines have had to follow suit.